black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Yeah. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be speaking to uh, Jonathan Odom, who will be sharing with us uh, his own personal encounters, uh, one when he was younger uh, with his father, and then a couple when he's been out actually looking for the creature. And, And Jonathan's got some very, very interesting encounters. And what I like about Jonathan is he'll also be sharing with us some of the weird things that have happened to him in the woods. That may not be Sasquatch related, but definitely some odd, strange things. And then the the second hour, I'll be talking with uh, Thomas Seawood, uh, the First Nations uh, tribal member from Canada. And you guys remember Tom from uh, the last couple shows that I've done with him. And Tom's a wealth of knowledge. I know he looks into this uh, subject with a lot of heart. And he's going to be sharing with us his theory on Sasquatch and smallpox. And if Sasquatch are actually affected by uh, smallpox or other diseases that uh, we as humans carry, very interesting discussion. You'll definitely want to hang around for that one. I know I was thinking about uh, Ron Moorhead. Uh, Him and I talk, uh, you know, from time to time about our different theories, about different things that we discuss. And I noticed he had posted this uh, 911 recording, and you guys have always heard it in the intro uh, about the guy that's like, he, Jesus Christ, the thing's, you know, it's standing right in front of me. And the 911 operator is, uh, <laughs> I always cut off the part where she says, uh oh, because I always end up laughing at that part. Uh, not that it's funny, I just mean to hear her response, you know, uh oh, uh, it's just kind of, uh, that's not what you want to hear from a 911 operator <laughs> when you're in trouble. Uh, But this is interesting. You know, I talked to Ron several years back about this gentleman in this 911 call, and Ron interviewed him. Uh, Ron Moore had talked with him, and I guess the guy doesn't really want to talk about Bigfoot anymore. He doesn't really want to discuss it, uh, because I've asked Ron to put me in touch with him. And I know if if the guy was willing, Ron would do it in two seconds, uh, have him on the show. But and if, when you listen, you can hear the fear in this guy's voice. I know you guys have heard it a million times. Uh, but what was interesting is he had called, I, I knew he had called 911 a couple times uh, because of this issue. Here is the first and second call that he made to 911. And then Ron also talks about uh, Sasquatch and dogs. I posted this to the blog on SasquatchChronicles.com. Uh, but take a listen. 911, what are you reporting? I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? 
it a person or an animal or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. Uh, a good sized man or something. It looks like a man. I don't know what it was. Just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. Oh, and the guy is on foot. This... I don't know what... It, it, it's, it's a big... Real big person. That's all I can say. Okay, but it is a it is a person. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was a person, somebody really big. But he's all in black. He's is he a black male or a white male? Did you actually see whether, or was he just wearing black? He's all black and he's big. He is big. I was in Washington. I interviewed him uh, a few years ago, several years ago, actually. And that's a pretty a pretty good report. So I I, I edited it because he called in two different times about two weeks apart. We we got a hold of the tapes from the sheriff's department, and uh, it was thrown 35 feet, and it passed through the air over this fence about nine feet high. Just prior to that, the man said he heard his dog yelp and a big thump, like it just got knocked on the ground. I was looking around to see if there's any horses in the area that could have kicked it or anything like that, but uh, that just wasn't what. Well, no, there was no horses in the area. Old, old dog that was just really normally stayed in in by his feet. He had two younger dogs that always went out yelping and all that stuff. But these two dogs, his other dogs, came cowering in. And that's when his big German Shepherd went out. And he lost his dog that night. And uh, it bothered him. It really did. He, he, was, he really loved his dog. He had already buried it. He would not give us permission to dig it up. Sure. So that's all we can say. Thrown 35 feet and 9 feet in the air. And I have to ask Ron, if, if my memory's right, I think the German Shepherd actually had its neck broke before it was thrown. Uh, that's why the guy was saying it was dead before it even hit the ground. Uh, but it's that is a fascinating account to me. And I'll have to ask Ron about it. I'll definitely have to get more info on Ron about it. I know him and I have talked about it over the years. Uh, but I'll have to have him on and, and discuss that. I know Ron Moorhead will be coming up on a future show, helping me with the Lovelock Cave story. And I'm hoping to uh, get that out by, I'd like to do it by Christmas, uh, because the Lovelock Cave encounter is such a fascinating encounter to me. If you get a chance, look up Lovelock Caves and Bigfoot or Lovelock Caves and Sasquatch, uh, and you'll find all the information you want on it. But it's a very interesting encounter. And speaking of encounters, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, get additional shows. If you missed Friday's show, it was the return of the monkey man, uh, almost a two-hour show. I had two separate witnesses on, and uh, they both had very, very fascinating accounts. Uh, I want to thank uh, Phil again for coming on. And I want to thank Tom for coming on. Both Northeastern encounters. I think uh, Phil was in Maine and Tom was in New Jersey uh, when they were talking about their encounters. And just interesting. Both guys had a lot of details. So you definitely don't want to miss that. And if you're looking for a gift, I know it's that time of year when we get each other's gifts. We exchange gifts. We give and receive uh, on SasquatchChronicles.com at the top. If you actually click on Shop... Uh, there's some cool stuff in the store you can get uh, for a loved one or anyone into Bigfoot. It's definitely some cool gear. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Jonathan Odom to the show. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you being here. Hey, man, thank you for inviting me, and uh, you do a wonderful job. It's an honor. Uh, you're my guest. The honor's mine. Thank you again for uh, for being here. And Jonathan, you know, you've been looking into the subject for a long time. You've been investigating it. Uh, researching it and really looking into this uh, subject. But what I found fascinating with most researchers, most investigators, even a lot of enthusiasts, uh, it all starts with an encounter, something they can't explain happened to them. And then they really start looking into this. If you would, could you start from the beginning and talk about the encounter you had with your dad? 
for the audience, just walk us into what happened. Yeah, I uh, I grew up. Uh, my dad was a preacher, and we used to fish a lot in uh, Franklin County in Alabama. And uh, there was a set of lakes up there called Bear Creek Lakes, and it was uh, very remote. We would fight, fish up there for rock bass. And uh, one morning, got up early, and we were uh, fishing, and we ran around the bank and. I remember I was in the front of the, ba- the boat, and there was uh, something in the water bent down, and it uh, it stood up, looked at me and my father, and slowly walked up the bank. And what my dad would do is he had a little trolling motor on a little aluminum boat, and he would, uh, you know, he would turn it on, we'd coast and fish, and this thing. I mean, looked right at us, and, and it and I describe it as like a like a, a Chewbacca, you know, because it looked at us had long brown hair, and and it was so surreal when it happened because I was at the front of the boat fishing, and we both, you know, were just mesmerized, and it just, uh, and the, you know, it was so, you know, it's just so odd. It just, uh, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm I'm repeating myself, but it, it just. It was just crazy to, to have that happen, and it t- turned and looked at us, and then walked up the bank. And I remember remember us watching it walk to the top of the hill and just disappear. And I, I look back on it now, and I asked my dad about it a couple weeks ago, and we've talked about it several times. And and before then, you know, I had never really had an interest in Bigfoot. I had a big interest in the paranormal, but not Bigfoot. What had happened, you know, it kind of just shakes you. You know, it kind of just completely changes you. And I don't remember us ever really talking about it afterwards. I remember it happening, and it was just so stunning when it happened that we, we never did talk about it till years later, and I brought it up, and I, and I asked my dad, I said, do you remember that? And he said, yeah, you know, I remember it vividly. And it was just kind of, uh, that was the start of it, you know, and then I started reading about it, and the more I read about it, I always had an interest in it, you know, and so that's how it started, you know, I guess just, uh, and I think it was, uh, I don't remember exactly how it was, but it was life-changing, very life-changing. Yeah, and encounters and sightings in themselves are always life-changing. I, I don't think I've ever spoken to one person that has seen it, that it didn't change their life in some way. Why don't you think you and your dad talked about it afterwards? You know, I, I don't know. I wonder about that a lot. You know, because when I talked to him a couple, you know, a couple weeks ago about it, just to kind of refresh his memory with what I'm doing right now with filming this creature, you know, I, I think it was, uh, I think it just stunned both of us because it was, it was so out of the norm, and and you know, and and, and I remember looking back on it just. It was. I don't know. I just. I don't know. That's what's very, very odd about now with with stuff when I on YouTube now. I remember it crisply, you know. But then, you know, I don't know. He, my dad was a preacher, of course. So I don't know if it was something that just shook him to the core, or shook me to the core, or or what. It was just. It was very unusual, you know. And even even he said the other day was like, you know, I, I know we didn't talk about it, you know. And and I I don't know. That's. I go over it a thousand times in my mind and just try to think about why, you know, why it didn't, you know, why it didn't register, you know, why didn't we say, whoa, what just happened? You know, I, I mean, I just don't know. It's, that's a very, uh, something I've mulled over a lot. It's actually very common uh, between witnesses. A lot of witnesses I've yeah. had on the show, I'll get two hunters together that had an encounter. And it's very common for them to say when they were leaving, they didn't talk about it. Uh, when they went home, they didn't talk about it. It wasn't until years later that they actually spoke about it. And I almost kind of think it, that it kind of short circuits the brain when you see something like that, because you're told these things aren't really real, uh, and there's nothing like that out there. And then when you see it, it's almost like your brain reboots, and then you spend a lot of time trying to process what you saw, what what you actually experienced. How big was a creature? Do you remember? I mean, compared to like your dad at the time. Oh, it was huge. It was, I, I would say, snap judgment, it was at least uh, seven or eight feet tall. Because I remember when it was going up the bank, there were several little trees, and it was right 
the shoulders are right at the top of them. And what's crazy is that 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 lake is very rocky. It's a lot of rock outcropping. When I was talking to my dad, my dad said the other day, he said, do you remember how fast it went up the bank? And I was like, I do. I remember it went up so fast that it was just like 30 seconds. It was up the hill and over the top and gone. And if you look at the total maps of that place now, it's very, very steep. And it has an attribute now, I look back, of a lot of the lakes that I've done a lot of filming with my YouTube channel now, and the attributes are it's very steep, usually very remote, and um, steep, remote, there's usually one access point in for, for the humans, but for the creature, there's just many, and there's a lot of cover. And, you know, and that's what was craziest, uh, the, the ease that it moved. You know, it was it, it was very, uh, when something's that big, whether it's an elephant, lion, whatever, and it moves, I think that's what's amazing. This thing was just smooth, you know, and there's no way it was a, it was anything man in a costume or, I mean, because, uh, you know, and I know you've interviewed a lot of guys, and it's just, it was just, uh, I think that's the word, just it was smooth, very smooth. It was like, you know, it's been in the woods a long time. You know, yeah, and you hear a lot of witnesses talk about that. I mean, I've I've spoken about that. I'm sure you have too with the other encounters. That I had oh, one yeah. witness one time. He said it moved. It reminded him moving like you would see a mountain lion move, just smooth, effortless, and that's really how he described it. And, and he's right. It's very smooth. It's very effortless for the size of these things. You would think they'd be a lot more clumsy. You would think that they would be loud like a bear or stumble like a bear. Uh, but you're right. They're very, very smooth. At what point did you decide you were going to start looking for these things? I know this happened when you were younger, but as you got older, at what point did you think, I'm going to go start looking for these things? I'm going to start really investigating this. Well, this February of this year, 2016, I uh, I was around an area that had a lot of encounters, but I, I just didn't realize it. And I've always been an outdoorsman, always been a woodsman. And when I'm out in the woods before this time, you know, I had always I had always wondered back to it, you know, is there something here? And I was around one of our local lakes front that I do a lot of filming, and I went a little uh, a stream that flows into the lake, a little tributary, and I was walking, and and I, I heard something behind me, and then I turned, and when I I kept walking up, there's a little slot canyon. And there's a tree, and I've got a picture of it on my YouTube channel, and there's one sitting there. And it, it it's like a juvenile. It, it was very small. And when I was <clears throat> when that happened, I was like, I didn't move because, once again, it was just everything came back. The emotions came back from the first one. I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, oh, wow. And what's odd is, is I got a picture. And after I got the picture... I don't I don't remember too much after I remember it getting up and walking straight away from me but I did not uh I didn't even have an idea to take another picture and I think what it is is kind of what we talked about like yesterday is the psycholog the psychology of a sighting I was so stunned it was just like but it was almost uh it was almost mystical. Like this time I meant to, you know, it, it meant for me to get a picture. It meant for me for it to walk off. And with the psychology, I call it the psychology of a sighting. You know, you have a lot of people say, well, I throw down on that thing. I to draw down. And no, 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 you won't. Because I think it, like you said, it shakes the mind. It shakes the senses. And it kind of, like you said, it reboots. It, it's very, um, uh, it's very odd. So once I saw the one in February, I, I started doing a lot of research and knew some of the people that lived around the lake and started asking them. And they're like, yeah, this has been happening. You know, and what was weird about them, it, it, they had had encounters uh, with this creature for 60 or 70 years, and their family had had encounters and just never talked about them. It was just something that happened, and, and that really, really intrigued me. You know, once I got to interview him, he, I interviewed him one time, and then uh, that was in March after I had my encounter, and then they wouldn't talk about it. They started having stuff happen around their house. Their house and car would have stuff pelted, you know, around their, the car, around the property. So after that, I said, you know what, I'm just going to start looking, 
and 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 filming this thing myself. And that's how I started filming with the YouTube, you know. And it was uh, it's been it's been a bit amazing journey, you know. I've learned a lot of lessons. I've seen it two or three times. Uh, I've got one video where I talk where I'm coming up on the hill and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm graphing about the YouTube community basically <laughs> about how people are are trolls and stuff like that. And I hear this weird scream, and uh, I'm filming to the left and the right, and I, I see some movement, but I hear this god-awful scream, and I still don't know what it was to this day. And I focus my camera, and there's one looking at me, just straight looking at me, brown, and on my YouTube channel, you can see it. And what is crazy about it is my battery died. I had a full battery. I was ready, and my battery died. So I'm sitting there, and I'm changing my battery, and while I'm changing my battery, I'm looking at this thing still, still staring at me, and I'm thinking, okay, don't go nowhere. Else. Get another battery in, film it for about, I don't know exactly how long it was. Boom, second battery gone, just like that. And I'm very religious about checking my batteries, uh, making sure they don't they don't drain. And once my second battery drained, that creature got up looked me dead in the eye, turned around and walked off like it, like it was nothing. So this, you know, it was, it was just crazy. It was just earth shaking. And then I started talking to a lot of people and a lot of people had battery drained just like that, you know? Yeah. I want to come back to the battery draining, but when the creature stood up and looked at you, can you describe what you saw for the audience? Yes. It looked almost like, uh, like a caveman and a, uh, I can't pronounce the word, uh, like a caveman, basically. Had a high brow across, straight across. The face was, uh, the face was really bunched up. It was very noticeable, the face. It was huge. I, I mean, I think this one was about, if he wasn't eight feet tall, he was nine feet tall. And he looked right at me, and then when he walked off, big, broad shoulders. His shoulders looked like it was, they were three feet wide. Three or four. I mean, it was huge, and it was just nonchalant. Walked right off, you know. And brown, uh, kind of a light brown hair, and I couldn't tell if it was really long or if it was kind of short. But he and, it, and another thing, it moved through the woods very silent. I didn't hear any crunching when it walked off, and it, it was odd. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know. And so once uh, once my second battery died i was like you know i'm getting out of here and the next day the next day you can ask my ask my wife i i, I didn't sleep any that night any that night i was so stuck i said i've got to go back and check that i've got to go back and check that so i got up early next morning four o'clock in the morning it was in the woods by six it was light hot down there went to where it was and it was a huge place where it had laid down apparently and i was like you know, I was so excited, you know, but, but, I, but I, even I had that because I want to debunk if I can. I think a good investigator tries to debunk. And once I saw where it laid down, I was just like, dude, you know, it, it just blew me away, you know. I can imagine. I can definitely imagine. What's your take on the batteries dying? What do you think about that? It's a strange coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is. It, and there's another thing that has happened around when I've got around with some some of the tree bins. Uh, I, I've had several instances where I'm filming. I'm around uh, bins that's over old forest roads and over, in, you know, just in the in the woods and the bush. My camera does something very odd. In some of my videos, you can see it. It'll do it like a jumping motion whenever you zoom in and zoom out. And I have a Panasonic Lumox uh, camera. And I sent it into the manufacturer because I was worried. So my videos, this when I would focus around the tree bends, it would uh, it would it would shake. They sent it back to me. No, Mr. Roman, there's nothing wrong with your camera. So I don't know if it has something to do with the tree bends or the battery dying. It has to be tied in altogether because I've had other instances where nothing happened with the battery. You know, I've had some with the battery, some without. You know, and when they get around the tree bends, I've also had battery a tree. Uh, pardon me, I've had battery drain with the tree bends. You know, and that's the one. That's one thing I've asked a ranger here that lives in Talladega National Forest. I've asked him. I said, you know, dude, what's up with all of these closed roads? I, I said, 
they go places, but you close them. And a lot of these closed roads that I've been on have huge tree bends over the roads. What does, does that have to do with stuff? I don't know. And, and he would tell me, he said, you know, Jonathan, I, we don't know. And to me, I, I think they do know. And so I have a friend that is a aerial uh, surveyor. And what he does, he has a couple of airplanes, and he films sections of the ground for GIS mapping. And so one day I asked him, I said, hey, dude, I got some areas that, that I've, I've been wondering about. And he would tell me that the areas a lot of times that I would give him where I would find tree bins and where my camera would mess up, he would say that they would have homology, uh, magnetic homology. I can't say the word. Anomaly. Magnetic. Like an anomaly. Yes. Yeah. At the, during these places. So a lot of times I was thinking, you know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something to the tree bins. And he would ask me, well, why are you asking me this? And, and I would say, well, this, this, this. And he would say, well, that's weird because they move around and sometimes they have to completely refly, refly areas. So I'm thinking with some of these roads, with these bins, camera malfunctions, that, you know, maybe David Pilates does have a point. Maybe that's where something happens, you know. And, you know, you know, just like me, the more you investigate with this stuff, the more stranger it gets. Yeah, that's know? true. It's true. The more you look into this, the the weirder it gets. And I hate to say that because I would love for it not to get weird. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, especially out there, you know, but uh, you're right. The more you look into it, the more strange it seems to get. You know, the the one you got on picture uh, sitting there, you definitely got something there. I'm kind of surprised it oh, yeah. hasn't made the rounds on the Internet more than it has because it's and it looks small. Is that just a picture? Yeah. I mean, the thing looks like it's. I'd compare it to like a 12 or 13 year old kid. Yeah, that would, that's exactly, it, it was just small. It was very small. And, and, and I mean, it was very, very, and that's what was weird about it. And when it walked off, it, um, you know, it walked off like a, like a grown up. It wasn't, it didn't, uh, I mean, it moved very smooth in the woods. It, it didn't, it was, you know, if you're a kid and you walk off, you're going to skip, you're going to jump, you're going to, maybe trip over something, this thing didn't. But yes, it was very small, very small. Did the creature vocalize or anything as it walked off? No, it looked, uh, once I got the picture, and here's what was odd about it, is when I got the picture, it was just like, it knew I got it. And it was just like, okay, we're done here. Photo session done. And it once it turned and, and walked off, it no, it didn't vocalize or anything. It was very... You know, and I think that's why I was so stunned because it was like, hey, I'm just jump, going through the neighborhood here, you know. Because I've had several people, like, why didn't you take another picture? And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think I was just stunned, you know, but they did not vocalize, no. Yeah, and I, and in most people, even your hardcore researchers or investigators, whatever they are, uh, even those people in those situations would be hard-pressed to sit there and start filming or even take their camera out. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you've encountered them in the past. I found anyway, but when you encounter them again, you're just as terrified as you were the first time around. Uh, and, and you have that moment of what the hell did I just get myself into? Uh, and I would imagine I'd feel the same way, even if I came across a, a smaller one. Have you had anything aggressive happen out there or have you had any aggressive reports around that lake? Uh, not around that lake. I have had several aggressive encounters that I actually caught on camera that were growls. And, and what was very weird about the growls is when it happened, I couldn't see it. And and, and that right there is uh, it, it's freaky in itself. I had two different encounters with the growls. One was kind of like a uh, rhododendron uh, group of, of trees. And I seen it on the path, and it went to the left. And then I went into the little trees, the rhododendrons, uh, or mountain laurels, whatever they were, and once I went in, you could see stick structures. And then, but after I got to a certain point, then it growled, and I was like, you know what, this is, it's got the tactical advantage, and I and I left. The other one was at a place called Pine Glen Campground. It's in the Talladega National Forest. Now I was there by myself, set the camera up, and as soon as I had the camera up, I heard the growl. That one was very another one odd. But it, what was odd about the growl? It was very. Um, it was very loud, 
but there was nothing around. That one kind of freaked me out. It, it really did because, you know, it was summertime, uh, everything, birds were chirping, and you could hear the growl, you could hear it on camera, but it's there's nothing there. And that one kind of freaked me out. It really did because, it, I mean, when you get a growl, there's nothing there, and you're like, uh-oh. You know, this thing, if it wanted to, it could it could do some damage because that because you know I scanned around, scanned around with the camera, nothing there, you know, and it was it was intense. But I've you know I've always in the woods, I've always didn't want to panic because, and it was I was lucky that time because I was in the campground, I wasn't out in the bush. Now if I've been out miles and I hear a growl, it, it's gonna scare me. <laughs> it's gonna scare me big time because I know that uh, at any time. It could, it could possibly take me out, get me, do whatever the hell it wants to do. And I have a lot of people ask me, aren't you scared? And and I am scared sometimes, but a lot of times I'm so far back, I cannot give in to that fear. And on the other hand, there's been several times that if it wanted to take me out, it could. Yeah, and I'll be honest with you, because I've, I've had a lot of people, well, take a gun, take a forty four, you can shoot it. I don't think you would get that opportunity if it was super aggressive. I don't think the ones in Alabama are super aggressive. Now, the ones in Texas, they, they probably are. I haven't encountered one to, that was super aggressive to the point that I was worried for my life because when I'm out there filming and I'm out so far in the bush, I have to be very controlled in my thinking because if I get panicked and I start running or whatever, I'm going to get hurt, and I, I just, you know, I have to be very level-headed, you know. I can definitely understand that. It's interesting, you know, the the area around the lake, you'd mentioned you you spoke with some of the people around there. What type of encounters were they having out there? The story that they had told me is the grandfather had, uh, once they had downed the lake up, had bought land close to the lake. And he apparently, uh, I think 60 or 70 years old, had seen it right off. And they were they were they were part Cherokees, I think is what he told me. And his thing was is is they left them alone, and vice versa, they left each other alone. And they had a, he said an understanding, you know. And for generations, uh, this guy's dad saw it, uh, his grandfather saw it, and it was just uh, understood that this side this was your side of the lake, and this is mine, and everything was fine. Once I started filming them and started talking about them and really, uh, I guess, hunting, hunting, hunting them, they, they, they broke off from contact. And the reason they broke off contact, they said that the stuff started changing. Uh, stuff would be thrown at their cars, their houses, uh, sticks placed on top of the car. And they were afraid that since I had uh, interviewed them, did it kind of change the dynamic? And they were Cherokee, like I said before. So they were a little bit more spiritual with it and had, uh, I don't know if they ever left offerings for it or whatever, but it was uh, it was like the balance of power had uh, had been upset. And when I had filmed uh, Mac at the lake where he, his dad had had some of the counters, we actually saw – in that that first video with Mac, we actually saw one at the top of the hill peering over, and I got it on camera. So the, after that, they broke off contact, and but they it always was a peaceful uh, cohabitation with each one of them until I filmed them, and once I filmed them, everything kind of uh, went to hell in the handbasket, I guess. And and and, and I respected that because they lived there, and they've lived there for a long time, so I knew that. There was an understanding, and and I talked to him every once in a while, and and the activity has went down, you know. But they were very. Uh, I, I did feel bad because activity picked up once I started filming. That's when I backed off. That's really interesting. Uh, I don't know that I've heard that before, but um, it's an interesting take on the whole thing. You know, you showing up and the dynamic of the relationship kind of changes. And I, where, where I had saw the juvenile was where his grandfather in the 30s, whenever the, dam, the lake was dammed, had had an encounter. So, you know, it's almost like, uh, I guess if, if you believe in fate, fate led me there for some reason, you know. And, and, and that's one of my main 
uh, hunting areas now with me and my team is we go there quite a bit a lot. We were there Saturday night, and we, uh, we're we still there quite a bit. And they if they've left them alone, but we still we still got to get a lot of really good evidence there. What type of uh, vocalizations do you get in the area? We get a lot of uh, we get a lot of yells. Uh, we've got some whoops. We haven't got very many wood knocks. We've got one or two. Uh, we've got one here recently where we had uh, we're starting to really think outside the box. And I had talked to you about it where we had the spirit box. And this was about uh, two miles from their house. We were in a little ravine. And uh, I told John, I said, well, let's, let's do a spirit box session. It's such a it's such a different kind of thing. And he said, okay. So we started filming, and as soon as he started up, we we got a we got a yell. But then the coyotes, they tagged they 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 were right on top of the audio. And around that area, a lot of times, if an airplane goes over, if a train goes by that you can hear, they will be right up under that audio. And uh, one thing with the coyotes that's very odd about them is they will – the Bigfoot vocalization will start up, and then the coyotes will come over it. And my theory is two things. They either uh, start vocalization and they scare the coyotes, one theory, or number two, they use the coyotes as a cover, or three, it's the Bigfoot – Coyotes are the same thing, but it, it's, I don't know, it's just very odd because they love to be undercover. We've got them on audio only one or two times, just them just going by themselves. Uh, another thing that they do is they do an owl call. And what's funny is I've got a recording uh, close to Mac's house where it's an owl, starts off as an owl, and then it gets choked up. And it's 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 about a minute long. It's the funniest thing ever. It gets choked up, and then it tries to start back, and, and it and it can't sound like an owl no more. And I've sent it to several universities, and they're like, uh, Jonathan, this is this is not an owl, but it's uh, mostly the yells, the the owls. Um, have you ever heard something called a bonnie bird? I have. Yeah, we hear a lot of that, a lot of that. And what's crazy. When we set out our recorders, we'll get, we'll, they'll be two or three miles apart, and you'll hear one with one recorder, and then ten seconds later you hear another one, and that is a, that's a pretty amazing thing to hear, because it, it, it's because like, you know they're close, you know. We've been, we've been down in the woods, uh, several times and heard it. I mean, it had to have been within a five hundred thousand feet of us, and then hear it start calling. So yeah, that's type of the vocalizations we get around there. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned the uh, the coyotes and the the Sasquatch. I, the first time I really noticed that was out in uh, at the uh, Browns property here in Washington State. You would hear the Sasquatch go off, and then you hear the coyotes go off. Well, I noticed the exact same thing when I was in Texas. Uh, you'd hear the Sasquatch go off, and then all the coyotes would all start going off at once. And you're right; it does overpower that first yell. And I know some people have taken heat when they record it, and people go, ah, oh, it's just coyotes. Well, listen to the first 10 seconds. That's not a coyote in there. The rest of them are coyotes. Uh, and it's interesting. Yep. It makes you wonder if they're setting the coyotes off or if they're working together or, or if they're using it just as a cover. They'll know the coyotes will go off if they scream and yell. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got a, I've got a recording uh, where a uh, well-known uh, Bigfoot show was uh, recorded in Silicon Alabama. The guys invited me down there. So I went down there, and I go there quite a bit. And – there is a uh, there's, it starts off as a as a Bigfoot call like two three seconds then it goes into a coyote call and the coyotes are cutting up and then you start hearing them yelping and it's crazy because you start hearing them yelping and then if you've ever heard coyotes this never happens silence I mean dead silence and we all looked at each other like uh oh somebody just got their ass whooped <laughs> you know and but it's odd because I have never heard – I've heard coyotes trail off. I've heard them, you know, run in the distance, whatever, but I've never heard them completely stop like that. And so I wonder a lot about that audio. You know, was it by them or something and it startled them? I mean, that that audio was very intriguing to me because I've never heard a coyote just stop dead like that, you know. 
Yeah, it is interesting. And then I was thinking about your spirit box thing, and I know some people might roll their eyes at that. Uh, but, you know, I it's like I was telling you, the guy in Texas uh, that I know, yeah, he's a uh, ghost hunter. And I'm a firm believer in demons, ghosts, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's more to this world, despite what most people think, uh, going on in this world. But he had one of those voice box. And... I, can't know that I don't know the official name for it, but basically it's a spirit box or a voice box or whatever, and I guess it allows this the spirit to talk through this box. He was out there one night with the Bigfoot guy, and the Bigfoot guy was telling the ghost hunter, "Well, ask him if he's seen any Bigfoots around here." And so the ghost hunter did, and and this was all caught on tape. And he asked him, and he was asking the the spirit if there was Sasquatch out here, uh, any Bigfoot or any large monkeys. Uh, and the voice came back and said, yes, they're very destructive. And I just thought that oh, was wow. fascinating. I mean, I really thought that's really an out-of-the-box uh, approach. And that area that they're in is notorious for sightings. It's also pretty well known for ghost sightings, too, as well. But um, it, it's I, – I thought, hey, that's fascinating to me. I mean, maybe the audience thinks that's a boring story, but I thought it was fascinating, the, that whole thing. When you're looking for these creatures, what are some of the things that you look for when you're in an area to where you think, ah, we'll check this area out? Well, the first thing that we do is usually is I take an audio sampling. I take, uh, you know, Sony digital recorders, and it's very simple. It's fun. it's so simple, it's funny. And I'll put them in a Ziploc bag, and I'll fill them, and I'll tie them to a tree, and I'll space them out a mile or two apart, two or three miles apart. And I'm doing audio sampling for a week or two. Uh, one one time I did 12 weeks, and I had all kinds of recordings. And once I get the sampling and I start hearing things, I usually uh, will do some preliminary day investigations, look for tree structures, footprints, and, and just kind of see uh, what the area looks like in the day. Then when we do a night investigation, um, we, we we go out there in the dark, and uh, we, we used to go out there and have it shine a light a lot, and not no more. We've completely changed. What we do is we go out and we go completely dark, and once we go completely dark, they a lot of times they will come in and approach you. We've also found out, too, that if you build a campfire a lot of times, that they will come up to the campfire, and I mean, I'm talking about close. You can hear them moving. And so once we do the audio sampling, we know what's in the area. And, and we've sent out audio recorders and didn't get anything. But then again, we've, you know, we've got stuff. So we pretty much know then the act, the area's activity is active. Then we'll go in the database and we'll look for activity reports in that area, Bigfoot sightings. And sometimes there is, sometimes there's, there isn't. And that's how we found some of our best areas it, it is that way. Kind of uh trial and error sampling. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in the scientific process, trying to do it in a scientific way. Now, a lot of times out there filming, and when you're in the dark, that goes out the window because, you know, crazy stuff starts happening. And once we have stuff on, on, on audio recorder, we, we know that it's an active area. We know something. And a lot of times we'll talk to the Forest Service workers, workers and we'll talk to the rangers, and uh, so a lot of times... And I, I recommend this for any Bigfoot researchers. Make friends with them. Take them coffee. Take them, if they're working, you know, stop and give them a water. And eventually, a lot of these relationships I've built up over months, and they'll talk to you. And they'll tell you, hey, man, we saw something over here we couldn't explain. And with the rangers, uh, wash their eyes. You ask them a question, and they, they dart to the left, or they... They start him hauling around. Just be a people watcher, and, and you can pretty much tell if somebody's covering something up. And uh, usually, a person area we have a question about, uh, we'll ask them about it and just watch the reaction. The forest workers, a lot of times, they they actually clears the trails and clears the forest service roads. A lot of times, they'll tell you they'll be right up honest with you. Hey, yeah, we saw something over there. You know, and I've had many a times when I'm off by myself on a forest service road. And if the gates open and I go through it, it's National Forest, these filmmen come out and the rangers are there. And they're like, hey, how you doing? I'm going to talk to them. And to me, that's always very, I mean, how do they know that I'm out there? And, I, you know, a lot of times I'm not asking, y'all got sensors out here? No, no, no sensors. We just saw your truck wanting to talk. And they know what I'm doing, you know. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's very odd. 
Yeah, and it's a good idea to cultivate those relationships uh, with a lot of those people. Because you're right, if, if they're comfortable with you and you get them one-on-one -on -one and they know you don't have a camera and you don't have a microphone, they'll tell you stuff. Uh, and, and I'm talking at the lower level, these guys will tell you stuff. Uh, do you think the government's covering this up? I, you know, honestly, I do. I do, because here, here's what's odd. You know, and I've asked the Rangers and the Forest Service workers this. You know, how come old, old 527, uh, how come 527 is shut today? And sometimes I'm out there every day. Sometimes I'm out just the weekends. Oh, well, we're just, uh, we're doing some brush control, forest fire control there, you know. And then I'll, I'll come up there two later and it's open. And I'll go down it and, uh, and, and look. So I do think there is some some uh, government involvement. I'm pretty sure there has to be. You know, and it's just like with the David Pilates thing. Uh, and, you know, if you believe in portals and stuff with the Bigfoot the stuff over the roads, yeah, there there has to be a reason, rhyme or reason why they keep these roads shut. Some of them are open. Some of them are closed. And, you know, like I said, when I'm out there hunting, uh, Bigfoot hunting, and they, they know I'm out there. How do they know I'm out there besides seeing my truck? Of course, seeing my truck. So, yeah, I do think there is some government involvement. You know, there has to be. Yeah, I think they would have. I, I think the government's already solved this. So you and I are on the same path. I think they already have this figured out. Now, why they're covering it up is a whole different story. But I definitely, yeah. I'm with you 100%. I, I think that they are covering these these creatures, beings, whatever you want to call them, animals. Uh, they are definitely covering them up. What are you hoping to accomplish while you're out there? What is it that you're uh, – what's the main goal for going out there? Uh, the main goal is to just, you know, document the unknown. You know, not not, not just not just Bigfoot. Uh, if it's a dog man, dog man. If it's a UFO, UFO, paranormal, paranormal. What the Bigfoot is is just try to get it on camera and – you know, once you hear the yells and, and you see this thing, uh, try to document it. And, and I preach this to a lot of people that want to go on hunts and want to some, – and I take some people out every once in a while, and I, and I tell them, is, is I want to document, 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 because if you do not have no documentation, it did not happen. And I hate to be like that, but, you know, yes, when I approach a witness or somebody that sees somebody – I do not have that attitude when I'm interviewing because 90% of the time they wanted to get it, get it off their mind, and they don't have documentation. A lot of times they're true, but I, and I preach this to my team guys a lot, document, document, document. So I want to just – you don't want to document because something is out there. You cannot go out in the woods at nighttime, in the daytime, hear a whoop, hear a yell, and say there's nothing out there. You know, I mean, and I have a lot of skeptics, and that's good. Skeptics are good for business because eventually a skeptic, in my opinion, will become a believer when they have that encounter, and they will. You know, so I just want to document, you know, because uh, like I told you the other day, I think, I think it's probably been on camera hundreds of times, but there's just so many people that are skeptics that don't want to believe, that don't want to uh, – to cross that bridge of, of belief and admit something is outside their comfort, their realm of comfort, you know. So I want to document it. And what, and, you know, like we talked to you yesterday, once you hear that yell, you know that something is out there. And it is the most fabulous, it, it's the most awesome thing in the world because you cannot explain it. And you'll play it for somebody, they're like, well, that's a, that's a animal. Well, and then I'll send it to a university. Well, no, that's not an animal. We don't know what that is, Mr. Adam. So it's document and it's fascination. You know, you go out five or six hunts and we'll have nothing. But then that one hunt, you'll get a yell or you'll see a glimpse of something, some eye shine. And it's just, I guess you can tell I'm enthused by it. It's its changed yeah. my life. It's its a wonderful thing, you know. I can completely understand where you're, you're coming from. Are you opposed to one being shot? You know what? I don't think... One will ever be shot, and I'm not opposed to it. Uh, if it happens, I want to shake the person's hand, for number one. Now, there's been several accounts where it supposedly has happened, and, and it possibly could. I think for science, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it because I think once you open that door, that door is never going to be closed again. 
it's just like with people with uh, UFO disclosure. Well, once if the government ever sit, comes out and says, yes, there's, there's Bigfoot, yes, there's UFOs, that door is never going to be closed again. So I, I wouldn't be object to it, but I don't know. The person that brings one down, I want to shake his head because, uh, you know, I don't know if they can be, uh, but that's my personal opinion, you know. And I understand that. And I, you know, there is a lot of strange things that go on, not in every encounter. I would say most encounters are, are pretty, um, I don't want to say boring, but you, you don't have a lot of the weird stuff happen in probably 90% of the encounters. People just running right. across these things, you know, your hunters, your hikers, your campers. What's interesting, though, is when you get into an area that you keep going back to and you keep going back to, or let's say they're around your property and these creatures keep approaching, it's in those situations to where weird things happen, like your battery's being drained. Uh, you might look yeah. at that and go, well, that's a coincidence. Well, that's not the first coincidence I've heard with these things. And and I think uh, with these creatures, my my own personal belief is, is I I still think it's a form of a wild animal that can absolutely be killed. But uh, I guess for me, and, and I know you're, you're, you're pretty open to Jonathan, as you investigate yeah. this, it's very disingenuous not to look into all aspects of this thing um, and why, because right. there's so many questions uh, that most hardly anyone can answer. We can talk about their behavior. Okay. We can talk about the sounds they make. We can talk about tree yeah. structures or the rock throwing, very, very primate type behavior. But yeah. I've heard from a lot of very sincere people about some weird things that go on with these things. And I don't know what box to put. Th- I mean, I don't even know what box to put Sasquatch in beyond wild animal, but, yeah. and I, and I could be wrong yeah. in even saying that, but um, when you get some of the more weird stuff, it's kind of, I, you know, it's kind of frustrating for me because I look at it and I go, I, I don't know what to do with that. I believe it happened. I just don't know what to say right. say to you about that. Yeah, and I totally agree because, you know, like we talked about yesterday, once you start looking for this this creature, and we'll use that word as a safe word, creature, it opens up a whole other dimension of things. And, you know, the, the Cherokee... Every Native American in America has talked about these things. You know, in some form, they talk as a physical being. In some form, they talk as a spiritual being. And I think that's what's fascinating. You know, when I'm doing this 20 years, I don't think I'll still I'll know. Because once you start looking, the rabbit hole gets deeper and opens up bigger and bigger. You know, and, it, and it's a fascinating thing. You know, there's times that I've seen it, and I'm like, it's a real creature physically touch it. And then there's times that I've wondered where, what happened to it, you know, and you, you're absolutely right. I agree with you hundred percent. It, it's, uh, it's fascinating. You know, you, you know, it just, it's some, you know, it's just like with the little people. A couple of weeks ago, we were filming around a cemetery and we were going down and we, 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 there was reports of activity in this cemetery, a Bigfoot activity. So we're going along filming and it's cold and we, I sweep my camera around, and I have a big 160 ball light that I put on my camera, LED light. And I sweep to the left, and I see this little man, about a foot and a half tall, in green. And I was like, "Oh!" And, and my buddy in the video, you can hear him. He said, "What is it?" I said, "I just saw a little green man." Another instance of wow. When you go down that road, other things open up, and and. And since then, I've, I've done studying. I've heard people talk. Some of your guests have talked about the little people. And it was so odd to see it and, and experience it. It was just, you know, it was like, okay, your mind's blown enough of Bigfoot, but let's just throw this in here. So it's, it, it really can go into a lot of different things. You know, it's, it's, it's I don't know, it's yeah. amazing. I'm curious. So after what, that, that was, I was, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I wanted to ask you, what, what did the creature do? Nothing. It was it was like a miniature human being about a foot tall. When I swept, it it looked at me, and then it it jumped and was it disappeared. And that was what's crazy. And you know, I was like, "Whoa! What did what? You know, what just happened?" I mean, it was just odd. You know, it was there one minute. I swept because I have a you know I have a camera in one hand, a light in the other, and then boom, gone. 
I don't know. It was odd. Yeah. No, I <laughs> can imagine. It was minute and was it, not there the next minute. But it didn't really freak me out. I didn't fear, feel any kind of fear or anything like that. And, and so, you know, and I had heard reports before, and I just – and I, you know, kept them, and then and my buddy went on something about how before UFOs were seen, people had seen little green men, and I was like, well, yeah, I guess that. You know, but it, was, it was so uh, out of the ordinary, and it happened. It was just, uh, and then when I think about it, I'm like, wow, that's oh. that's pretty pretty amazing, you know. Oh, he wasn't green because of the night vision. He was actually green. Yeah, yeah, actually, no, it was no night vision. Yeah, he was actually green. That's what was weird about it because he was like, what the, you know, what, you know. Oh yeah. yeah, that's strange. Yeah, no, I'd, and it's I just had Tom Seawood on uh, last couple shows right around uh, yeah. Thanksgiving, I think it was, and he was talking about the little people and how the the fire crew was putting out a forest fire. Pretty soon, here comes this little being popping out of a, a downfall tree, and then three or four of its buddies get out of out of this downfall trees too as well, and then all the firefighters quit. <laughs> they want nothing to do with it. They're yeah. not going back up there. Uh, and, you know, he went into some details about the little people, but I've had witnesses on that have seen them. I think the smallest one that the person I had on, he, she said it was about three feet tall, uh, and it looked just like a little person. It didn't really, it was hairy like a Sasquatch, but it was proportioned, it was very much proportioned and looked very much human-like when she uh, when she saw it. And so, you know, and the natives talk about them being one to four feet tall, uh, depending on what Native Americans you talk to, uh, they'll describe yeah. these little people. Uh, most Native Americans really don't have a whole lot of good things to say about them, though, I've noticed, especially down yeah. in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. uh, they're spoken yeah. about as being very vicious. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, I mean, and nothing really, uh, I, something did happen after that, but I, and now that we're talking about it, I, I did trip over a, uh, a tree and smack my knee pretty hard. None of that I think about it. And, but, I, but, you know, I, you know, that you said that I didn't, nothing really bad happened except for I busted my knee, hurt my knee really bad, but it was, the, you know, it was just, the, I, I've had a lot of odd things happen. And, and, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, you didn't react very different on that because it, I, I've had a lot of stuff happen like, it. and it's just, when it happens, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's unusual dealing with the, the unusual, you know, you know, yeah, it is. It is very – and sometimes you're not really sure what to make of it. You know, it's bad enough no. seeing a Sasquatch, but when you have these other weird things happen, uh, especially out in oh, the yeah. woods, you, I mean, uh, there's weird things that happened to Woody and I when we were hunting. I've talked about it on many shows uh, where it sounded yeah. like a horse running right past us, and there was nothing there. This is way before Bigfoot. And both of us yeah. being very confused and looking at each other, and I'm like, what just happened? Uh, and it, yeah. but you don't know. You try and sum it up in your mind. Well, maybe sound trap. Maybe it was an elk running, and the sound traveled. And sometimes sound bounces in weird ways in the forest. Uh, but it was probably one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. I mean, it sounded like this thing just ran between the two of us. There yeah. was nothing there. I mean, I, I to this day I can't explain it. I, I the only way I chalk it up is maybe sound was bouncing, and elk was running further up on the hill, and the sound just bounced weird. I don't know. But it is. I mean, when you have yeah. weird things happen, <laughs> sometimes you don't know what to make of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we one of the uh, episodes on my, my YouTube channel is a dogman episode. So once I got this new team members together, we went at night investigated, and um, we were going up a hill, and one of my one of my guys was like, "You know, I see a lot off in the distance." And we were we were fifteen miles back. We hiked. We rode in on a mule like six miles, and then walked six miles in. And so we we saw this light. It was like a will o wisp, like fox fire. And then my one of my team members went to the left of me. One went to the right. So I'm on the in the inside left. And I shined my light beside my buddy. And there's a guy in a western looks like a west long western coat up on top of the hill to the right of him. I was like, dude, who is that? And he's like, what are you talking about? Turn my light again, and it was gone. Now, right where we were standing was an old grave that had been there since the 1890s. And it was, like you said, it's that split second. <clears throat> you see something, and then you're like, wow. 
And then it got him freaked out, and and I I, I under, totally understand because it was right beside him, you know. And you know we went ahead and finished our investigation, and that just blew my mind. And I've also got a friend that does a paranormal investigation. He lives around up around Shiloh, Tennessee, and he he's talked about the horse thing and actually heard horses on the battlefield, you know. And it's yeah, I totally that that's, that don't surprise me one bit, you know. That would almost terrify me more than running into a Sasquatch. I think running into a demon oh, yeah. or a ghost or whatever people want to call it, I, that would terrify me more than running into a Sasquatch. At least with the Sasquatch, I got a chance. <laughs> but you run in, I yeah. mean, you got a chance of fighting, whether as little of a chance as you think you have. But it, you, you can't fight stuff like that. And I, it's interesting, right. too, when you talk to a lot of these um, researchers, they run into stuff like that and they never talk about it. Privately, they'll tell you all kinds of weird stuff that happened to them out in the woods. Publicly, they'll never talk about it. And so it's it's terrifying when you run into stuff like that. I mean, how do you explain that? An old Western cowboy standing up there on the hill next to your friend, you go back and he's yeah. gone. Uh, that would be time for, yeah. <laughs> in my mind, that'd be time to go, time to get out of here. Yeah, and we actually did because uh, the creep factor was so strong. And when we when we left the area, we had to cross like a bluff, go through, go around a bluff, and then go over a stream. So yeah, when we we did leave because it was just like okay, it, it's time to. We've been out here a couple hours. It's time to. Uh, and it was the same place that I had that dog man encounter, and, and that um, that encounter pretty much. Um, at the moment when I was filming, I didn't know what was happening to me. And what I mean by that is I was very confused, very upset, didn't know what was going on. I couldn't find the cemetery that I was looking for. Once I got home and started coming to my footage, I got ice cold chills because I saw what was in my footage at the very end of my in my footage. I saw uh, what was this creature it was like about seven or eight feet tall, all in black, but the head looked like it had an antler on it. And I think it was a dog man. And but did the whole time I was filming, I was confused, didn't know what was going on. Once I got out, and in that encounter, once I looked back over my footage, I knew what was happening. But in the moment, I did not. And that was a that was a terrifying encounter. Now that I look back on it, it almost made me stop going by myself, but it, but it didn't, but it almost did. Yeah. And that would terrify me. So at the time you didn't see the creature. No, I crossed. What happened is, is when I was going in, I come across several big stick structures, X's and over this old forest service road that was uh, not in use anymore. It's decommissioned. And uh, before I crossed the stream, I was looking for a cemetery. Uh, old abandoned cemetery. It had showed up on the topo maps back into the 1890s, and uh, it was still it's on today's topo maps. And once I crossed the stream, I started getting real uh, disorientated. I couldn't I couldn't find the cemetery. The cemetery is exactly where it was supposed to be. Went back later and found it, but I couldn't find it. So I was wandering around in the woods, and if you watch my footage, you'll see. And I'm very confused. 99% of the time when I'm in the woods by myself, I'm in a very in control, but you can watch my footage and I'm very confused. And I was getting frustrated. I was like, where is this thing at? But then I started hearing odd things in the woods. And I was like, well, and so before I crossed the stream, before the oddness happened, I, I saw, uh, and I've had range, several rangers tell me about this off the record and for service records. I've seen uh, off in the distance on the hill, you could see a shimmering in the woods. And I've captured this several times on video and I've had, they've told me do not go toward these areas and they will never tell me why. Just tell me not to go toward these areas. Like a light. So shimmering? once I, it's almost like a shimmering with heat, but it's not heat. Okay. I it's so. almost like a pixelization of a picture. It's almost like there's a fake TV up there and it's pixelating an old Tommy TV pixelating in the woods. And I've caught it on camera several times. So before I crossed the stream, I had just caught that off in the woods, and I zoom on the video. You can I can I zoom in and you see it, and I, and I talk about don't go toward these places. And when I crossed the stream, everything went crazy. I couldn't I couldn't find where I was at. I couldn't find the cemetery, so I got really confused. And what's weird about that is 
I do mapping compass. I was good mapping compass. The compass was spinning around. It was just crazy. And so uh, I got me a water out, and I said, okay, let's just calm down. Let's figure out what's going on here. And I'm standing on a rock, and I, I see something out of the corner of my eye dart around the rock. And it's a, it's like a black, like a, it's like a black object. It was not, was not a Bigfoot. It was more like a spirit or something. So I was like, oh crap! So I chased it around. And so I'm winded because I'm going uphill, and I'm like, what's it? And I look down at my watch, and uh, I love Luminox watches, love them. And my watch said five minutes when I could, before when I came in. In, I was like, that's, that's impossible. That's impossible. My phone, Samsung Galaxy 7 phone, said 905. And I was like, what? And so my camera said 11 something. And I was like, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but it's time to get out. Once that happened, I got out there for, it, it was, it took me about 30 or 40 minutes just to get out. You know, and then, you know, I told you yesterday, my wife was freaking out. It was, where have you been? And because I tried to let somebody know where I'm going. So once I got home, I was like, you know, what's going on? I'm never like this in the woods. I'm very calm in the woods, very at ease in the woods. So I got my footage out, started looking through all of it. And I've got a scene when I crossed the, the I've got a scene where that I'm filming when I crossed the, the stream. That I'm panning and I'm talking to the camera like I do narrating. And I zoom in. And when I was zooming in, I, I did not notice this thing standing beside the tree. I mean, I just didn't see it. I, I still don't know how I didn't see it. And so I was like, what is that? And you can actually see it in my footage. And it is crazy. Then once I saw it in my footage, I knew exactly. I knew it was it was not Bigfoot. I knew it wasn't Bigfoot, but it was paranormal. It had to have been something paranormal. And it explained all the stuff that had happened. And once I uploaded the footage, I had some uh, a medicine man and uh, a medicine woman had emailed me. She said, hey, this is what this is. You need to be careful. And after that, I was like, oh, my God. You know, but it, it, it I knew what was happening to me in the woods. Uh, and, and, it, and it explained everything, you know. So it was crazy. Yeah, and I know you're into the paranormal, so uh, for a lot of people wondering why you didn't, it didn't just completely freak you out, that's why, because Jonathan actually has done a lot of stuff with the paranormal in the past, so uh, it probably wouldn't yeah. shake you up quite as much as it might, you know, like for me, I'd be like, I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> what did the medicine man and medicine woman say? What did they say you ran into? They they said it was a dog man, and, and once they said it was a dog man, you know, I started asking them, I said, well, what does that mean? And, and they told me, they said these things, uh, and they, they, they're they around a lot of uh, burial grounds. I said, but this was a uh, American, you know, uh, this was a, 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 a regular person. So it was, was not a Native American burial ground. And they were like, well, a lot of times uh, burial grounds are built on Native American burial grounds, which I did not know that. And they said these things will will manifest a uh, a body of an animal, uh, and, and that's how they manifest. And and that freaked me out even more because I'm thinking, you know, uh, so it's Native American and it's around a grave or a burial, Indian burial ground, and it basically uh, reanimates something dead out there. And, and the guy was like, yeah, that's exactly what it does. And, then, you know, once I found that out, man, it, it did scare me. I tell you, I was like, oh, because then it was daylight, you know, and, and that – uh, but it didn't scare me too much. So I went, we went back at night time, you know, and uh, it's uh, and that's what they explained to me. And I, it was very unusual, I thought, for them to even be talking about it. But they had seen my video and reached out to me, and I, it was very lucky. I, I, it was an honor for them to reach out and tell me. Since then, since we went back at night time, I, I don't go very much to that area. We get a lot of weird uh, audio recordings from that area. But they really, uh, they really helped me, and uh, I'm still in contact with them, you know. But once they warned me, and uh, I was like, "Well, I guess I better leave this alone." But they were very, uh, they were freaked out by it, actually. Yeah, I've noticed when you talk about the dog man. Um, I know every Native American kind of has their own, every tribe kind of has their own little word for it. But it's a very taboo subject 
with a lot of Native Americans. You bring up the Dogman, and they shut down pretty quick. Um, I've only had a very few people talk about it. And when they talk about it, it's very taboo. Uh, most of the time, they don't want to yeah. talk about it publicly. But they'll tell you all sorts of things about the Dogman. Uh, but I've heard uh, what the medicine man and woman told you. I've heard that on more than one occasion. And it's interesting, too, when witnesses come across the dog man, they always describe it as evil or they always describe uh, it as something wasn't right. It, there wasn't something right about it. And you don't quite get that with Sasquatch. You don't get people saying, I mean, sometimes you'll get witnesses that'll say it was evil, but not every witness will come back and say, well, it was evil. But with the dog man, it seems like most I'd probably say 99% of the witnesses that have come across it, they will say it's evil. There was something absolutely wrong with it. Uh, so that's interesting. And it's interesting, too, the the weird – I've heard that before. I don't want to speak on it at the moment, but I've heard something similar to what happened to you, Jonathan. I want to say there's a, um, a term for it. Maybe it was Bob Garrett that was talking about it. I'll have to ask him. Uh, but I have heard that before, that happening to people. And you know, and that's in 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 the the evil. That's you know, I, I alluded that my my father was a preacher, and when I look back on what what happened, because I take notes after every place I go to remember, and the, and especially when you're looking at the video, there was times in and I had people say, I "Man, you look like you were about to freak out," and and I was because number one, I was confused. Number two, I could not find what I was looking for. Number three, everything looked different, and and once I saw the thing uh, go up around the corner, uh, up the little slot canyon, and it was not a bigfoot, but it was black. Yeah, there there was some. It, it was it was almost like you said, very fearful because, and I had to be very careful coming out because it was in the middle of the summer. I had to watch out for snakes, watch out for the deadfall. But I do remember it was just like, God, it, it was very scary. <laughs> very scary, you know. Yeah, well, I'll have to have you back. You'll have to give us updates. Uh, Jonathan Odom, yes, uh, O-D-O-M. Check him out on YouTube. Subscribe to his channel. Uh, you can find a lot of his videos. I try and post them to the blog, too, as well. Uh, Jonathan, it was an honor having you on the show. Man, thank you. It's an honor. Keep doing what you do, and you do a great job. And thank you for having me on. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks again, Jonathan. If you get a chance to check out Jonathan's uh, YouTube channel, run over there and subscribe. Uh, Jonathan Odom, O-D-O-M. He's definitely got some cool videos on there. Very interesting videos. And the one thing I like about Jonathan is he's got a lot of balls. If he sees something weird or strange or experiences something strange, he'll tell you about it. He doesn't sugarcoat it. I like that about him. I, I like his, uh, his approach. And you know, a lot of these investigators researchers um i guess we'll call them investigators i know i sound grumpy tonight i'm really not uh but a lot of these investigators they will run into weird things out there in the woods and they won't talk about it privately they'll talk about it but publicly they won't and the shimmer he was talking about i could have sworn bob garrett talked about that i'm sure you guys probably know better than i do i'll have to call bob and and see i want to say it was a gold miners encounter he was talking about that very interesting stuff uh, again, Jonathan Odom, thank you so much for coming on. It was an honor having you on. And I'll have to have that guy back. I know he's definitely got uh, more stories and uh, more things to tell us. But because of time, uh, you know, it was, it was nice having you on, Jonathan. Thank you again. Let's jump to Thomas Seawood up there in Washington State. Thomas, thanks for coming on the show, man. Appreciate you being here. How are you tonight? Yeah, Kasla. Good to hear from you again. I'm doing good. Yeah, it's good to hear from you again, too. It's definitely good to hear from you. I hope you're uh, staying warm up there in uh, Washington, up north. Yeah, well, tomorrow I head further north, go back to Vancouver Island. But what are we doing here, sitting on, at our houses in front of computers? we got a beautiful one-foot low tide started last night all the way through until next Saturday. Full moon out tonight when I went and had a cigarette. We should be on the beaches looking for the big fellas. They'd be out hunting the, hunting the shellfish and the cockles for sure this week. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that uh, you came back to the show. For people, if they want to check out uh, Tom's website, it's hamumuadventures.com. And uh, Tom's going to be doing a lot of taking tourists out, looking for Sasquatch, going out on the boats. Uh, it's definitely good times. Hamumuadventures.com. 
And I know, Tom, you, you, I wanted to invite you back to the show. It went with something I've been thinking about uh, in, in regarding, uh, sometimes I hear these habituators and people who have these things on their property, and they'll leave them out chocolate bars, they'll leave them out uh, donuts, all sorts of things. And I cringe anyway on feeding these things, but I always think, you know, <laughs> what is it you're doing to the animal when you're leaving them chocolate bars and, and donuts? Uh, but you were talking about smallpox. Do you want to go into that? Yeah, it was a few years back when I was out in the bush. You know, like I said, said before, I didn't have TV out there. So when the wind was up and there's no tourists around, I had to find something to keep me occupied. So I was always just poking around, looking at things and taking it on a First Nations perspective from the world that I grew up all my life in. And knowing that the Kwakwakiwak Nation, Northern Vancouver Island region, in 19, they guesstimated 35 to 40,000 Kwakwakiwak when contact first happened on the West Coast. And in 1921 era, when they were doing a census of the native peoples throughout coastal British Columbia, the Kwakwakiwak, they had a hard time trying to find 1,200 remaining. Smallpox, namely, but also influenza, tuberculosis, venereal disease, they had swept through our nation since contact, and well over 95% of our people had vanished from the diseases. And, you know, it's not just the Kwakwakiwak. You know, you look at the Haida from Queen Charlotte Islands. It used to be called, they refer to it as Haida Gwai now, its rightful name. You know, they were over 90, 95% decimated by smallpox. And when you look at that on a social level, I'm so proud being a Kwakwakiwak because not only did these diseases just decimate our population, eradicating societies and people with knowledge that never had a chance to pass it on to the younger generations, you know, that takes a huge impact on your culture, your heritage, society as a whole, how it's made up of with this tier structure. And then all of a sudden you had the unjust colonial-based laws, such as the banning of the potlatch era that forbid our people to celebrate our way of life known as potlatch. And then they created these cinder block incinerators called residential schools, 181 of them throughout Canada that were to conform the native children into dominion of Canada, colonial law-abiding, God-fearing people. Well, they were nothing more than residential schools or nothing more than incinerators my opinion, to eradicate a people's culture and heritage. So the diseases and the unjust laws of the era, you look at 1921 when only 1,200 Kwakwakiwak remained, and yet from that small number we have grown to well over 12,000, I think it is, yet of all the coastal First Nations, we have one of the most intact and most complex structured cultures based upon the the different societies we have, the potlatch tying it all together. So I'm proud of that fact. But looking at the diseases as a whole, you know, we have archaeological remains called middens, abandoned native villages, that when I went to the elders and still do and ask them, you know, what was that? Oh, that was a small village. And apparently it got hit by smallpox. And then when I was out there and sea kayakers stay in there and they're eroding the midden structure, the black soil, which is made up of the organic material broken down from my ancestors living there seasonally and the shell and bone remains of their food discarded. You'd see these high-grade hammer stones and mortars and pestles and spearheads, copper items that showed that it was, you know, around that time of contact, even some of them with glass beads. And... You know, you don't just leave your tools. These people in these villages were decimated by smallpox. And you hear the stories where they were piling the dead bodies up like cordwood on the islets that were burial islets. And that it got so bad that they were just throwing them in the water. And, you know, it's not just the Kwakwakiwak. It's other coastal First Nations that I've heard the stories and read it in the different ship's journals and logs and things. And my research efforts through the years. So you can just imagine what it was like when the smallpox epidemic came. And then I started thinking about it. And I started thinking, you know, all the reading I've done as a kid. And, you know, my on, when I was a young boy, I was a pudgy Indian with black frame glasses. And my 
cousins used to call me Dilton Doyle because I was like that guy in the Archie comic books. I always had my head in the book. I was always trying to learn something. And I remember them, you know, when I was reading and I was thinking about all these diseases. And then when I got a little older as a teenager and, you know, I started hearing the stories about Junahua, the wild woman in the woods. And I'm thinking, hey, that's kind of like our Sasquatch, I think. So I started reading the books by Green and instant reports like the Patterson-Gimlin incident and others. And I remember reading these things and I'm thinking, you know, you look at Lewis and Clark uh, going across the continent for the Americans and coming down the Columbia River and reporting, seeing something that wasn't human, that was large, bipedal, covered in hair. You have uh, other report reports from explorers and voyagers in Canada and Hudson's Bay trade post officials, and the list goes on. You And, you know, you even had a train in the Canadian Pacific Railway see a jacko, a passed-out Sasquatch on the railway tracks by Yale in the Fraser Canyon that they picked up, apparently, and captured and died of disease going over to Europe and to be shown in all these different things like Barnum and Bailey circuses, I guess. And I was thinking about it going, you know, Jacko died from disease because all of a sudden he interacted with non-Indigenous people. He interacted with railway workers and then in the cities being looked at by the people and then all of a sudden going across the ocean apparently to Europe and he dies of disease. Well, that tells me that the Sasquatch Bigfoot possibly was susceptible to the European Asian based diseases as were the indigenous people across Turtle Island. And if we look at Turtle Island, Mexico, Canada, United States, we know that 300 to 500 million indigenous people vanished due to diseases, one of them mainly being smallpox. So then I look at all these reports about there's not very many people coming across the, what would be United States and Canada. Yet the reports are, you know, most of them have something to say about these bush apes, mountain apes, mountain gorillas, uh, mountain devils. And then all of a sudden you get into the later part of the 1800s after the major smallpox epidemics and you don't see many reports. And then on coastal British Columbia through the late 1800s into when I was a young man, our child in the late 60s, we had Indian villages that were in inhabited people living in them all through my traditional territories at Broughton Archipelago and it's indicative of coastal British Columbia. You had homesteaders out there with their 40 acre parcels. You had Jippo loggers out there with their floating community and camps moving about harvesting timber right from the saltwater shorelines. So you had a lot of people out in the territories even in a place called Lock Barrel Inlet. They had a carousel for the trains to turn around and it was a community. And it had, you know, a hospital and all these things. Now it's just all growth, overgrown, just like a Mayan city. It's been taken over by the rainforest. And then we see in my region that I'm looking into, you see an increase in the amount of sighting reports. Is it because there's more people out there? No, I don't think so. They're really out there in the summertime. The, the mariners on their yachts, the uh, sea kayakers and sailboaters. But year-round, throughout the late 1800s to the mid-60s, there was people out there year-round, yet the sighting reports aren't that high. There's not much records of them. But now in these modern times, we're starting to see an increase from the clam diggers, the loggers that are out in some of these semi-isolated places, even some of the natives that are living out there, and even the sea kayakers and the yachters in the summer times are reporting them. So we're seeing an increase in sighting, but it's what I'm magic of the internet, the modern day smoke signal, I'm almost seeing that it's happening across Turtle Island. There's a big increase. We know of the skunk ape. We know of every, you know, all these different states that have, looks to me like an increase in sightings. Canada as well. I went, just lived in the Northwest Territories for a year, north of the 60th parallel on the edge of the Arctic. And there's, they set it up there. There's an increase in sightings. And of course, if we look at us as humans, you know, look, like I say to Peggy, as we drive around Kent, Washington, and Seattle, I just look at her and shake my head and gridlock and go, Peggy, there's too many damn people here. Some of these people got to move away. You can't travel no more. <laughs> yeah, it's you true. Know? And that's like that across from what I'm hearing. It's like that all over Turtle Island. So there's a definitely a drastic increase in the amount of humans. 
I think that's also showing us with the sighting reports, there's a possible increase in Sasquatches. We're hearing just in the last five, six, seven years, I know I'm seeing more reports and blob squatches on the internet about them having babies. There's one little baby that you see all blob squatchy in a tree with his mother peeking around apparently. You see the one that someone took where there's apples in their front yard. They set up a camera. Some people are calling the owl taken off or landing. I remember when Dr. John Bindernagel, when that picture first came out and it wasn't even released to the public yet. And he called me and I went to Campbell River or to Courtney in Vancouver Island where he lives. And he goes, Tom, I got to show you something. He goes, what do you think? And I looked at that black and white photo and I looked up at him. I said, that's a Junokha. That's a wild woman of the woods. She's got a baby under her left arm. Look, you can see its little hand hanging on to her bicep. I bet you anything it's a baby with it. So hopefully... There is a population increase in Sasquatch Bigfoot throughout Turtle Island. But smallpox, you know, I'm starting to research more and more and have been for the last couple of years because I think that's what decimated the Sasquatch populations was smallpox. And I had one report years ago. I was just a young teenager and I remember we're sitting on a commercial sane boat, salmon fish boat, and we're all just shooting the BS and came up talking about Jonah, a wild woman in the woods. And, of course, they were just interested. The older guys were just interested in scaring the bejesus out of me. And we're, I was listening away and, you know, being Dilton Doyle, I was telling me 10,000 questions. And that's when uh, I said, uh, what about when our people got wiped out by smallpox? What happened to the Jonah? They died too? Uh, remember that crewman looked at me and goes, interesting, interesting. He goes, I remember when I was a little boy, I remember hearing stories about them being smallpox too. And that's all he said. And then today, just out of the blue, I was made a phone call to one of the archipelagos, which is a group of islands on the British Columbia coast. At this time, I don't want to divulge which one. I got a lot of research I want to do first. But uh, we're just shooting the BS talking and we got around to talking about their stories the stories from up in that region of the Sasquatch Bigfoot and uh, I mentioned I said well you guys were wiped out pretty hard too with smallpox you ever hear any stories about the big fella getting smallpox and he goes yeah you know what I heard this few times now the story about one of the villages when the people were down with the smallpox. People were dying. They're in bad, bad shape. Big fella family came in and they were carrying their younger ones all diseased up and they were dragging the, the other adults that were sick and they went to the humans. And he goes, I don't know if they're talking to them or not, but they were basically got into the edge of the village and they're showing like they needed help. They were all pocked up. And the humans, they couldn't do anything. They showed them their people all pocked up and dying as well. And apparently that family just turned around and walked back in the bush. And then he said, the elders now that know those stories and and saw the animal when they were younger up here, they're gone too now. They've passed on. It's unfortunate. I should ask them more questions. He goes, but they used to say that they're extinct up here because the smallpox took them away. He goes, but there's others. They say they're still around. And I've heard a lot of stories up here about them being around. But people know that they're really afraid of being around us. They don't want to be near us. They see us, they just take off. And that's a pattern I'm starting to see established by the questions I'm asking. And now with the modern day smoke signal, Facebook and social media and Internet as a whole, I'm now reaching out. I just talked to a through private message, I just talked to a young man up in Alaska. I mean, boy, he got beautiful pictures in the tundra hunting and everything. Real bushman like me. But he's got to talk to the native people about the stories up there. So I'm going to reach out to more of my fellow aboriginals and non-aboriginals, of course. Uh, you know, we're all united here on Turtle Island. And I'm going to start asking that question. Do you have any stories or hear of any stories about disease and smallpox that might have affected the Sasquatch Bigfoot as well. 
I'd be real curious to see what you find out on that because you wouldn't think unless they're really close to us in the gene pool. I mean, really, <laughs> really close to us, it, that smallpox wouldn't affect them. Now, I'm almost kind of curious if small pe- uh, smallpox affect uh, chimpanzees or apes or because um, you know a lot of the same diseases that we get affected by primates, it doesn't bother them one bit. But if they're really close to us in the gene pool, I can definitely see how that would wipe them out. The other thing, too, would be interesting to find out is were the reports dying because no one was around? Everyone was dying, and so the reports of Sasquatch went way down? Or was it because they were being affected by um, smallpox? And so it'd be interesting to find out. I'd love to, as you research this further, I'd love to see what you come across. Um, I have had, I've talked to a few Native Americans that say they can get affected by our diseases, but no one's ever really gone into it. No one's ever really said this or that. You know what I mean? But I have spoken to some Native Americans here in, in the States that say they absolutely can be affected by the same diseases we get affected by. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you and I and, you know, a bunch of the other people that were affiliated with the enthusiast researcher, you know, especially the guys that are on social media, me included now, thanks to you, Wes. But anyway, um, we can only go so far. We're the scouts. We're the point men, point woman. You know, we can only go so far. And if, I don't think that we can tread any further out on the ice because we we don't have that knowledge. You know, we're not the ologists. It's up to those doctors, the ologists, to lead us further onto that ice, so to speak, so we don't fall through by twisting things around and end up BS and not saying the right things. You know, we look at uh, today, for example, you know, I was sitting there scratching my head, pondering away, having my cigarette outside in my Aboriginal moments. And I'm like, man, I got to figure this out. And I'm like, hey, I know. So I run inside and the magic of the internet. And I pulled up Jeff Meldrum's profile and <laughs> sent him a private message. And, you know, right away he's, said something and I said no 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 I, I said I need your expertise and knowledge on some questions I have I said I can only go so far I said I'm a PhD in Bushman I said but when it comes to the sciences stuff I said that's where you got to take over I just need to get some direction if I'm going the right way and right away this opened up and now I'm going to hook up with them hopefully in the new year here like early in the new year and I'm basically just going to be Tommy 10,000 questions and fire away at him and have this you know guy with years of schooling you know make sure that i stay on the right path and ask the right questions and you know that's that's what we need to do as enthusiast researchers you know we can only go so far on that ice and we can't go too far we have to work cooperate and work with everyone yeah it's interesting smallpox i just looked it up affects only humans no animals or insects can be affected by it but you know if they're close to us in the gene pool I mean, really close to us in the gene pool, which seems to make a lot of sense that they are. Uh, I could well, see even, how it might affect them. Well, even if we're not that close on the gene pool, you know, here on coastal British Columbia, we had uh, seals and sea lions, I guess they call them pinnipeds or something. They were getting sick a few years back. And I remember we were warned, if you see them, don't go near them. That disease they have can be transferred to humans. And then you hear about bird f- flus, you know. Well, there's a good That's example true. of how genetically not close we are because I sure as heck don't have no feathers under my armpits. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, it's you got those ologists that made those statements that there's no way that it can be transferred to so-and-so. But you got to remember, they're just it's just their theory, you know. They don't have any good conclusive proof on it. They said they eradicated smallpox in 1959 yet it's been showing up every now and again. Now it's even, when I was doing my research, there's even global projections on a terrorist act by using smallpox, you know, and how, what it looks like in day one, two, three, four, by the time it gets to day 10, Tom Seawood being an Indian, he's dead, I'll tell you that, you know. So it's, smallpox is, you know, I don't think we should overlook it. At the same time, I don't think we should take it too lightly uh, that is, and get too bogged down on that, oh, I don't think they're genetically close. Hey, they got two legs, two arms, ten toes, ten fingers. We know that. We've got the prints and casts to prove it. And then we got the sighting reports. They're pretty darn close to a human. And, you know, I know if I seen a 
Sasquatch through my spotting scope and I seen it had a bunch of pox. Well, you know, the question is, do I go in and get a better picture so that I can get conclusive proof? Hell no. You know, that's native people. We're highly susceptible to tuberculosis even to this day. And I know darn well I'm highly susceptible to smallpox, even though I've been immunized for it, you know. But, you know, there's no way I'm going to go get a closer shot if I see a sick animal like a Sasquatch with smallpox. You know, I know mean, oh, some people might put on the comments on this, you know, oh, that's far-fetched to that. Well, when you're in a bushman and you're out there, chances of seeing an animal and getting really close to them is an animal that's injured or sick. So bush rule kicks in, and that out trumps any concrete opinion. So... That's one thing, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to go out there looking for smallpox Sasquatches because I believe the epidemic's over. And now the population is growing. But going back to the diseases on them, you know, I don't I don't think we have to, you know, we have to look, I guess the best way to put it, know your history so you're never destined to repeat its failures. That being said... 300 to 500 million indigenous people and throughout the Americas were wiped out from diseases. Is there a chance Sasquatch can catch something for, from us? I believe so. And I'm going to hopefully play around with, what do you call it, a theory or a thesis or whatever. I'm going to play around with that by doing interviews and putting some things down to text here, as I always do. But, like, remember when I was telling you that podcast when we had garlic being taken, you know, off the sprig on the hanging off the nails yeah. so we thought it was animals taking it so we put it under a clear glass cup lo and behold our garlic was missing again the cup was upside down the next day and then you know we knew who was taking it it was the big fella that was coming into the camp then i you know put my foot down to the crew you know one of my crew had uh you know he rugged life grew up in the streets kind of thing and he had hepatitis and you know we took precautions he had his own dishes. He had his own wash area. He didn't do any of the cooking, you know. So, you know, even in the modern day, you know, it's acceptable. Hey, you got a disease. We're not going to ostracize you and, you know, push you in a canoe and push you away from our village. You're going to work with us, live with us. We're just going to work with you so that we don't get it. So that's when I all of a sudden I thought, hey, you guys, I said, you know, those people always putting out them candy bars and peanut butter and that for the big fellas. I said, you know what? We shouldn't do that. I said, you know. Number one, we're habituating the animal. Last thing we want is a pissed off Sasquatch and his family coming down here throwing sticks and rocks at us because we ran out of garlic and it's blowing 45 and we can't get no more because we can't get out in a speedboat. I said, we don't want that. Next point, I said, you know, we know about smallpox and the diseases, what it did to our people. You know, look at a few years ago that SARS came through, 2003. I built my brand new tour boat at the time and I got it. I was sick for almost two and a half months. I had one foot in the grave and the other in the hanging on, standing on a banana peel. I was ready to slip in the six foot hole for good. I was so sick. I said, and you got hepatitis. I said, we got to always show respect to the big fellas. I said, we can't be getting them sick. So no more garlic out and try to keep all the food in the house. Now I said, we can't take that chance. And that was it. Bush rule 101 kicks in, you know, the rules have been said, that's the way it's going to be. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm against what people are doing with, I get, what do you what do you call that word when they go give stuff, gifting? Yeah, gifting. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just, personally, I wouldn't do it um, because of that disease possibility transfer. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, there is a lot of diseases that get transferred to animals. I'm sitting here thinking, well, rabies can be transferred from a dog to us. And so you can transfer diseases back and forth. And so, you know, the older you, the older I get, and you probably feel the same way, Tom, the older I get, the more I realize as I look around at the world around me, I realize no one's smarter than I am. I mean, you have your occasional people that are smarter than you are, but I'm, generally speaking, no one's really smarter than you are. Uh, and, and, you know, you never know. It could be wiping them out. You know, only a fool would say, well, that's a bogus theory. There's nothing to it. Uh, there might be something to that. You might be right. It makes me wonder about like diabetes. You know, if you're feeding Sasquatch donuts every day and you're gifting with them donuts and chocolate bars and everything else, uh, maybe they could develop these different diseases. I, I wish I, there was a witness I had on one time. I don't think he actually came on the show. It was a hunter and he was talking about hearing coughing out in the woods and he thought it was another hunter. And what he said he saw was a huge ape. 
Um, but it, he heard coughing. Uh, and I always thought that was a real weird, strange report because I'd never heard anyone say that before. Uh, but he heard this constant coughing, almost like you hear someone with a cold or uh, the flu, how they'll cough constantly. That's what this guy was hearing. And moments after hearing that, he saw a what he described as a gorilla walking out of the, the woods on two legs and walking off into the, bu- off into the bush. Uh, and I always, that, that one report always stuck with me. And I, and I don't know, I never knew really what to make of that. The other thing too, you're talking about your village being wiped out. You know, if your village was wiped out, let's say most of the, the uh, uh, First Nation people were wiped out from smallpox, you would think the Sasquatch population would double or triple now that all the humans are gone. Uh, they have free reign of everything. So you think there'd be a population explosion, and there wasn't. So it makes you wonder, maybe there is something to it. It's it's definitely an interesting theory to look into, that's for sure. Well, like two months ago, we had two grizzly bear siblings show up in Alert Bay, Corman Island, you know, connected to Vancouver Island with a ferry, you know, 35-minute ride. You know, basically, as far as I'm concerned, it is part of Vancouver Island. It's so close. But two grizzly bears show up. Everyone's like, what the heck? What the heck? Two bears. Well, when I used to be a grizzly bear and black bear hunting guide, 1997, that was at the tail end of the crash of the salmon during that crash cycle we had on coastal British Columbia, south coast. And I watched cannibalism take place. A big grizzly bear hunted down a smaller grizzly bear trying to chase what few salmon were in this riffle. When that big grizzly bear came over the sand dunes in that river, he wasn't interested in the half dozen fish and fish that that little grizzly bear was after. He was after that young pup, and I watched him stalk in like a cat, pounce off that bank when he had the optimum chance, and he killed that young guy and threw him over his shoulder and carried him in the bush and probably ate him. Well, he did eat him, but you know that's bush. And when I saw that exodus from the mainland. Okay, on the northeastern side of the Broughton Archipelago from Kinkum Inlet, uh, Thompson Sound Inlet, Bond Sound Inlet, uh, what do you call it, uh, Jury Inlet area, East and Lockborough, you started seeing this westward migration of grizzly bears. And you'd see, and see them on the islands. And then all of a sudden in 90, 90, 2001, there was a grizzly bear shot in Port Hardy on Vancouver Island. First one recorded ever shot on Vancouver Island. A year later, I helped put one down in Sayward, north central, eastern Vancouver Island. We heard other stories of grizzly bears on Vancouver Island, and, you know, there's still reports of them there. So it showed a western migration. When people asked me, well, how come this is happening now and back in the day? And I said, well, back in the day, you got to remember that. In the late 1800s, 1920, 30s period, there were very few Kwakwakiwak out there. We'd been decimated by the diseases. But any grizzly bear we did see out there, we would harvest because it was food. It was uh, used for ceremonial and social uses, meaning the bones were used for amulets to draw out the diseases someone might have in your family or a friend. And then, of course, the uh, fur was used for the grizzly bear dances and attributed to one of our societies. And the claws, of course, even to this day, are still highly sought after. But it, there's hardly any humans, as you stated. And as and, and I'm agreeing, there was no Kwakwakiwak out there. But there was all these homesteaders. There was all these loggers. And what do loggers do up until 19, late 1980s when they saw a grizzly bear or black bear close to their camps? They shot him and dug a hole, threw him in there, and that was it. And so you had a natural barrier to stop that westward migration of the grizzly bears. So what you just stated about, well, the humans disappeared, shouldn't the Sasquatch population explode? Well, yeah, that's Bush Rule 101. It goes back to Bush Code. That's the way it's chiseled in stone, and thou shall happen that way. But it didn't, and that's what I'm saying. There was no population explosion in the late 1800s to the mid 1900s that we're hearing about in the reports so that correlates to was there a possibility that they too were decimated by the diseases i think so and now that we're possibly seeing an increase in sasquatch numbers maybe we're going to start to see 
that westward migration take place or is taking place right now because I've noticed it in the western Ar- Proton Archipelago in the last 20 years and maybe we're going to start seeing them more and more on Vancouver Island and which seems to be some of the reports because we're getting a lot more reports from the west side of Vancouver Island in the last 10 years than we've had in any other period in the last 100 you definitely might be onto something there. I've never thought of that. I've never really given it too much thought. Uh, even as you and I were talking, I was thinking about the donuts and all the other stuff, all the crap people claim they leave for these things. It it, it was, I think it was Bear. I don't know if you know Bear, uh, Jim King. He was talking about how you don't leave him that stuff because it can make him sick. It can, uh, and, and I don't think a lot of people think like that. But your smallpox theory, I definitely think there's something to it, Tom. I think you're you might be onto something. The more I, the more I listen to it, uh, it'd be interesting. I wonder if there's any First Nation elders around that could shed some insight on it. I'm going to see one to, day after tomorrow. That's why I, one of the reasons I'm heading to Vancouver Island. He's actually phoned my father and called me in. And under our Kwakwakiwak law, when I get called in to talk to to hear from this man i have to do it hell or high water so that's where i'll be thursday morning i'll be sitting with him and i imagine he has something to ask me or want of me and then afterwards it's going to be tommy ten thousand questions and smallpox and diseases to situna is going to be what's on the table that morning well you'll have to come back and uh give us an update tell us oh. what, what you found out i'd love to hear what you find out on this well, you got the best moccasin telegraph from what I'm seeing, you know, you just, with you getting me on as this podcast, you know, after Operation Sea Monkey, you know, you've just created a supernova and I thank you so much for it, you know, for people wanting to reach out to me and get more insight into the First Nations part and my experiences being out in the bush for so long. You know, I went, like I told you on last podcast when I went to Sasquatch Island and checked on that group. My friend started and it had that button that said, this group needs an administrator. This administrator, I went and clicked it. And lo and behold, Sasquatch Island in the last eight days has gone from 42 members in the group to close to 800 by tomorrow of we'll crack 800. And what I'm doing on Sasquatch Island, and hopefully everyone joins that group, is I'm just, I'm not focusing on to what I call the generic, the stuff that's just been beaten like a dead dog. You know, all the same old stories, same old speculations and that. I'm just coming out with the First Nations stuff based upon back Vancouver Island because the North Part's my traditional territory, so I can speak on that. But it's indicative of all of the Pacific Northwest coastal region from bottom end of Washington State, Northern Oregon, all the way up to Southeast Alaska. So I'm putting things on there like uh, yesterday, every morning I get up and I put a post and it was on the high concentrations of salmon in the streams and all this protein source and and pictures. And people were overwhelmed that aren't from the Pacific Northwest that, you know, here is a river that like your first sentence says, you know, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's, you can literally walk across their backs from bank to bank. They're that thick. And then I showed the pictures and gave some reports on it. This morning's was Ooligan, the candlefish. Tomorrow, if I won't have time to post, but maybe tomorrow night I'll post on uh, seaweed and other kelp species that are found on Pacific Northwest. But people on Sasquatch that go to Sasquatch Island, they're starting to see that it's, wow, this is Pacific Northwest. This is Sasquatch Haven. This is, you know, they got so much protein, you know, and if you look at humans, compare it to humans, once you get east into the Rocky Mountains, coastal mountains and eastwards, throughout United States and America, the Indians, native peoples that lived out there were hunter-gatherers. They were always trying to get enough food to live, move and to get more food. Out here in the Pacific Northwest, Northern Oregon, Washington State, British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, you know, there's a reason why we're built like Volkswagens. We're short and well-rounded at our, at our wheel wells. You know, we're chubby buggers, most of us, because we have so much food. This is like our people say, Hiladi, the land of plenty. And that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to get words out, you know, especially with you, that, you know, hopefully more people will come to this area. You know, I need a hand out there. It's big turf out there. And, you know, hopefully we can get some conclusive proof. And, and you know, smallpox is something that we really have to think about. Do we gift? I'm not going to allow it with any one of the people I bring out into the bush. No gifting. You know, we use trip cameras with maybe a 
some cockles or something, but it's not gifting, it's bait. So there's a difference between gifting and bait. I know I'll be hearing a lot of grief on that one, but oh well. But No, nah, not as much as you would think. Because, uh, you know, as far as the show goes, I'm I'm completely against it. And not that yeah. every listener is completely against it, but I'm completely against it. I'm with you 100% on that. I think it's a bad idea. Now, if you want to bait them to get a picture, that's a different story. Um, I even had a guy on one time that he would go out and gift him every time. He'd always bring food every single time. Well, the one time he didn't bring food, he almost lost his life. Like, wow. Out of the area. And the guy was telling me how... So they're such gentle creatures and they, you know, they'll never hurt you. They'll never harm you. And the one time he went into the area and he was trying to set up cameras, he didn't bring any food with him. Uh, he came close to losing his life. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. And it's an honor to have you on, Tom. I always enjoy talking to you. I always enjoy uh, your, your theories and your knowledge on the subject. You know, a lot of these researchers, I think it's pretty well known. I, I don't get along with too many researchers in this field. Not that I don't get along with, but a lot of them drive me nuts. Uh, I hate the, I've been doing this for 40 years and blah, 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 blah. And then you ask them, well, tell me five things interesting about Sasquatch that no one knows. And they got nothing. They can't tell you two things that are interesting that uh, you haven't heard from a witness on the show or, um, but, uh, you know, I, that's why I like it, you because you you really look outside of the box and uh, all the Native American stories and I've learned so much just in the last week. I've, I've spoken to a few natives in the Southwest that went into detail about the dog man. And the more they told me, the more I wished I wouldn't have asked the question. I guess, <laughs> I guess it's one of those things to where it's, you know, be careful what you ask because you might just get the answer to it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I always enjoy having you on. And and for people out there, if they look up Sasquatch Island that, that uh, Tom is referencing, it's a uh, Facebook group. I like it. Tom posts a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, I, I know she did post the salmon thing. I was just checking that out about three hours ago. The Sasquatch Island, uh, you can check out Tom on Facebook under Thomas Seawood, S-E-W-I-D. And if you get a chance, check out his hamumuadventures.com. It's H-A-M-O-O-M-O-O uh, adventures.com, hamumuadventures.com. Tom, thanks for coming on as always. It's an honor. I always enjoy talking with you. Thank you very much. I'm going to Sasquatch Island tomorrow until we talk again, Wes, and everyone out there. Halakulisla. Go in peace. Thank you very much. You too, my friend. Thanks, Tom. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. Uh, get additional shows. If you're looking for a gift under the shop, there are some cool items, some cool uh, Sasquatch gear. Check it out if you get a chance. Have a great night, everyone. I will see you guys next time. Something that quiets with the lights on.